Hello and welcome. <laughs> Plastic is like a soap opera. It, there's so many of these similar characteristics. We have hmm, anger, guilt, fear, deceit, corruption. There's also hope and compassion and love. There's heroes, there's villains. And today, this panel, this seriously dynamite panel, we are gonna open up the doors to all of this drama. What's real, what's not? And how can you find a sense of empowerment and purpose moving forward to really help create change for the future of plastic? On this panel, right, we have, like I said, some really dynamite folks uh, in no particular order. We have Ryan, who is the founder of the Great Sea Project. Um, I don't know, Ryan, want to say a quick hi? Hi. <laughs> and then we have Patricia. She is the uh, CEO and visionary for Matrix 4, who does a lot with sustainable manufacturing and injection molding. Hey, Patricia. Hi. And we have Haley, who is the Global Sustainability Director for Dow and uh, lots of expertise on the really massive scale of plastic, of course, but also global sustainability. Hey, Haley. Hey. So before we move further and really jump into the meat of questions, I want to invite us all to really get settled and centered in, in your space. Breath is like the most powerful link to creating presence and letting go of expectation and preparing your body to go on a journey of receiving. Together, breathe in nice and slowly from your tailbone all the way up through your lungs and lift the crown of your head. Just pause there for one moment to feel it and then exhale and let it melt down your body. And just breathe naturally through the reverb. Remind yourself that you are here right now, ready to help change the world. All right, thank you for doing that with me. And to get started, now we'll jump in with a big question. Plastic, what works and what doesn't work? So this is, of course, I'm so interested from each of you, um, you know, very specific to your industry and your space and your background, what's working. And then also like, systemically, right? what is working and what's, what's not. Um, this, we can kind of have a little bit of back and forth, but first I'll just randomly, I'll just call on Ryan <laughs> and say, Ryan, what do you think is working? What do you think isn't working with plastic? Yeah, that's the million dollar question. And I think why we're all here and why we're also invested in this for sure. Um, I think there's a lot of things that work with plastic. And I think the, the problem that we're all gonna discuss today is that, you know, what is the real problem and is there a real solution? Um, I think, you know, off the top of my head, the three things that come uh, to mind for me as it impacts the projects that I work in is inconsistency in manufacturing is one of the big problems that I see. Um, the recycling industry as a whole um, and the lack of regulation that exists around the industry um, and also um, consumer behavior and lack of education on, you know, can we live with plastic and can we live without plastic? Um, so I think those are the, the three things that are kind of top of mind for me. And, um, you know, I, I hope they drive part of the conversation for sure. Awesome. Um, Patricia, curious on your thoughts. What works? What doesn't? Well, you know, I think all the way back to the start, the idea that humans could create materials was so revolutionary. And I think brought the idea or the concept that we could actually save natural resources by creating something that didn't use them. Um, and I think at the same time, it also freed humans from social and economic impacts that were imposed by scarcity of natural resources. And I think that dates back to Bakelite and what happened during World War II. And obviously on the back end of World War II, um, when it created jobs and manufacturing was a great source of job creation as, as well as the middle class. 
Um, but I think, unfortunately, you know, although it challenged all of the traditional materials by, you know, replacing steel in cars or paper and glass and packaging or wooden furniture, because it was lightweight, it was stronger, um, it was durable, it could be sanitary. Um, I think it also created what became synonymous with the commoditization or cheapness of plastic. Um, which has resulted, I think, in the fact that it became disposable, which has created a huge problem, obviously, in landfills and our oceans. And I think for all of the reasons it was beneficial, it also never goes away and it doesn't break down. And so I think that end of life um, conversation is something that we're all part of now to say, what is possible and how do we upcycle that into something different while considering what other plastics are possible? Haley. So this demand on natural resources is going to continue to increase, but how do we protect the resources and still move towards circular models um, uh, for the world? So a, a few things on my side of what I believe is, is not working. Um, plastics are only recycled at 9% globally. And one of the things that I think is behind this uh, statistic is really a systemic issue in regards to infrastructure. Um, consumer preferences are constantly changing with, with what we want, uh, how we want that delivered, where we want that delivered, when we want that delivered, um, or to pick that up. So, I, you know, and I exaggerate a little bit, but my point is that in innovation is always continuing and advancing based on consumer preferences. And I don't feel like infrastructure has been expanded or invested in to, uh, to really upgrade these newer types of innovations or packaging materials that, that are coming on the marketplace. So there's an opportunity to build that back into the circular economy. Um, what I think is working is um, we, we do have to be honest with ourselves on all of the, the ways that plastics are still incredibly important to society from keeping food fresh and you know, hospitals safe. Um, but I think one area that's not really understood because it's not seen is uh, plastics are, are, are vital in playing a role in a low carbon future. So there was a study out there um, by, by an organization called True Cost where they um, evaluate the true cost of different, two different alternatives. And um, they looked at um, plastic materials compared to metal and glass, for example. And they showed that you're going to have a 4x increase in your carbon footprint if you move back to traditional material, materials like metal and glass. So my, my point is that it's not one factor that's more important than the other, but I do believe that with a thoughtful, comprehensive, and pretty strategic approach, um, we can eliminate waste, we can keep products fresh, and we can find new models to ultimately infinitely recycle and keep these materials in motion. Yeah, no, um, I know Haley, you mentioned like keeping food fresh. One of the things that when I'm mentoring and like talking even about eco-anxiety, like there's so much anxiety around how do we, you know, with plastic specifically, but in general, how do we help create a more friendly humanity for the planet. Um, but with food, keeping food fresh, one of the things I like to say is, you know, specifically there's the example of like wrapping a cucumber. There's even a book, like I think, what's it called? Why shrink wrap a cucumber or something like that. But like when you do that, you keep the food fresh for four times longer. So it's really helping prevent food waste, which is another massive sustainability issue. Um, or I know with Patricia, we've talked about um, the benefits to like the automotive industry and the replacing heavier materials with lighter materials like plastic has also made a sustainability benefit by reducing um, uh, the need for fuel or obviously increasing fuel efficiency. So to me, we have a lot of this, like these are some of the things that are working uh, well and like human ingenuity and things, but then the problem on the back end, of course, is like pollution overall, I think. And how do we look at these materials and what's working, but then find either alternatives that operate very similarly to at least oil-based plastics, um, or you know, finding more efficient end of use or end of life life cycles. I think these these are the big problems. And um, I'll just address one other thing that we've talked about natural resources a bit, and I think. 
Um, there's also a slight disconnect sometimes with plastic. Like it still does come from a natural resource, right? And there's a lot of different sources. Plastic is such a huge category, but oil-based plastic, it comes from oil. And one of the problems that I also really pay attention to is there's like a misaligned valuation with what the cost of oil is. And that if we understood how precious of a resource it was, and I think actually should be, should cost us a lot more to use oil than it does, you know, that might create a different alignment with how we're using oil across all of industries, um, but in particular with plastics. Where, where does it align? Um, one, one more question on this topic. Ryan, you mentioned um, that a problem is inconsistencies in manufacturing. Can you say a little bit more about that? Well, definitely. I think with the alternatives of uh, different types of plastic that are, we're able to manufacture and also having a standard um, so that it is more recyclable. You know, we talk about the 9% um, that is not recycled. Um, that's part and parcel because of a couple reasons. So A, is some plastics that are manufactured are not recyclable. Um, it's just a fact and it won't get recycled or they're very hard to recycle. So the cost to recycle it is, it's cost prohibitive to recycle it rather than just dispose of it. And that then goes back into, you know, regulation in terms of the recycling sector itself. Any sector that becomes a billion dollar sector, like the recycling sector in North America, and that's where corruption comes in. And unfortunately, bad, bad practices. Literally, you could fill a room with the amount of problems with the current plastic problem, right? It, it's on so many levels, whether it be socioeconomic or um, you know, whether it be, you know, food security or whether it be lack of regulation or whether it be, you know, different types of plastic. And I think there's no one root cause, but I think, you know, having a, an open discussion, especially with unique players like this room uh, will help, you know, uh, perpetuate some, some, uh, you know, misaligned information that's been, you know, put out there. Um, I think the average consumer doesn't doesn't fully understand it. They just say, oh, plastic bad. We need to get rid of it. Recycling good. You know, if I put it in my blue bin, it's going to get recycled. Well, they don't realize is it's not, um, especially if they don't do their due diligence at home. Right now, I'm going to introduce a short video uh, from Patricia that just introduces herself and what she's doing at, at Matrix Store. Hi, South by Southwest. I'm Patricia Miller, the CEO and visionary for the House of M4. We're a US-based, Chicago-area, sustainable industrial design studio and manufacturing factory focused on consumer products that are extensions of brands and experiences. In 2014, I acquired this business with nearly four decades of history, and I set out with the intent to dust off the antiquated business model of traditional manufacturing to make way for an integrated studio and factory while also creating something that aligned my spirit as a brand and product junkie, conscious of sustainability and the climate crisis. We believe in protecting Mother Earth and that we're at a driver's seat to take conscious action. In fact, at M4, we think our obligation is even higher. One of our culture standards is to embrace the principle of the Boy Scouts and my fellow Burning Man burners to leave no trace behind. I'm so excited to be here today to discuss plastic as an individual, who's consciously aware of the climate crisis and the impact of plastic within that, and as the owner of a house that does design and manufacturing with a focus in plastic. I'm here today in Honolulu, Hawaii, my heart home, where I became aware of microplastic and the garbage patch 15 years ago. My belief is only through having a seat at the table, an open mind, a conscious heart, and a collaborative intent will we create the changes we're in need of. Thanks for being here today. Moving into solutions. So specifically, I'm curious, um, I know we're all working on a variety of solutions. So maybe just think of one or two solutions that you are currently working on um, in your own, you know, your own projects, your own, your own kind of world. And uh, just describe a little bit of what you're excited about with those. Uh, Haley, let's start with you. Um, I think we all can agree that plastic is too valuable to be lost as waste, um, and we have to work on both the supply side and the demand side if we're really going to um, advance ourselves to a circular economy. Um, Ellen MacArthur 
um, a leader in circular economy has said that there's an economic opportunity to move to a circular economy just in Europe alone. It's about $1.8 trillion. So my point is from a, a business standpoint, whoever can solve these challenges will win the market. Um, and plastic is just one opportunity to rethink our systems, our business models, our ways of working. Um, one uh, a project that I, I would really like to highlight, or, or really it's, it's more like a, a new technology that's, that's out there, is something called advanced recycling. Today, most times, um, in, in most instances, recycling happens mechanically. So I take a bottle, I wash it, I clean it, I sort it, I chop it up, um, and then I resell the material as a post-consumer recycled product. Um, but that has its limitations in terms of quality. Um, but honestly, there are many new technologies out there today that are starting to take these materials and take them back down to their basic building blocks through a manufacturing process and creating plastics that can be used in some of the most stringent applications such as medical and food. And uh, we've been working on some pretty cool partnerships in this space and one um, is a company called Phoenix uh, where they actually take the product back to a, a pyrolysis uh, feedstock that we can use as an input into our plant and make a new product. So uh, this is really cool. Uh, I've seen a lot of companies and frankly startups really emerging in this space um, because ensuring that no plastic is lost is, lost is waste, but ultimately that we can infinitely recycle and keep these materials in motion in the circular economy is, is the aim. Awesome. Uh, Patricia, what's like, what are one or two solutions that you're really excited about? So we really looked at sustainability as a system, not just on the material side, but what are we doing as an overall house? How does it relate to operations, material design, manufacturing, the product? Um, and how do we make sure that we're creating products for brands that are most environmentally stable and aligned to our spirit or conscious? And so that equates to things like tiny pulses on a weekly basis of what are we pushing as a full company around sustainability? How are we not using single use water bottles in the factory? Um, what are we doing with any waste resin? How are we bringing it into our artist and residency program? Anytime we buy equipment or machines, how do we make sure we choose the most energy efficient option? What are we doing for our factory shutdowns? Um, what's our recycling program overall? And then I think the other one is getting our hands on any material and challenging materials overall um, and what's possible in developing a more comprehensive material library so that when someone comes to us to design a product or to manufacture it, we can offer many options and be able to share the pros, the cons, the availability, the costs, how we've processed it, um, what some of those implications are, really to try to reduce the burden or the hassle factor of making more conscious choices. You would just spend even just like uh, 20 or 30 seconds. Can you describe your artist in residence program? Sure. What I found is that most manufacturing companies really focused on efficiency. How do you make as many units as quick as possible, as cheap as possible? And we really wanted to reinfuse the creativity in the process of making and how do we value the resource um, as valuable. And, um, and, and, and so one of the ways in doing that was anything that could be deemed waste in our process, we save and then we convert it into objects of art by bringing in artists into the factory to create products or art um, with that material. Mm -hmm. I just think that's so cool. And from like a Bogle Brush perspective, at least like um, two like kind of specific things. I mean, one of course is experimenting and exploring um, how do we work with well recycled plastic materials and then also like alternative plastic materials. So working with plant-based plastics and how do you bring organics in to materials for the things that make sense, or if we don't need to use oil for it, then let's try to not. So by using those materials, we help push an industry and a demand forward for working with them. And then the other one is, is a, like a values-based thing. By creating products that include values for the environment and for giving back to the community, there's even a, like a subconscious thing that happens in the consumer where we start to shift what matters to us. 
that can help us in our purchasing decisions, of course, and in just like supply and demand kind of laws, but also on a broader economic level, I think one of my like life missions is to help shift the way that money really is valued. And I think that's one of the flaws is that uh, our economic system doesn't appropriately value for things like the environment and for health. So we're able to treat something like plastic, like it's garbage, even though its value is so much more than that. Uh, Ryan, solutions. So for us, the, the, we, you know, we're talking here now about the, the, the industry as a whole and, you know, so many different facets and levels of it. But for us, it's very simple. There was one problem we wanted to address, and that was ocean plastic. Um, so we're very pleased with our solutions to date. Um, it's been very grassroots and very community based. And as you'll find out from my intro video, I've been in the industry a really, really long time. Uh, and working with the communities that we're actually trying to impact a little bit more is really important because, you know, for us to create a sustainable solution of addressing this ocean plastic problem, we need help. Um, we can't do it all alone. So we're, our primary focus right now is in communities there where there is no recycling program. You know, we're lucky here in North America that we can just chuck it out in a blue bin. Um, in a lot of places uh, around the globe, and in particular where we're, we're working in the Caribbean, there is no recycling program. Um, so all of the waste that's produced on island ends up in the, the landfill. Um, when eventually it will end up out of that landfill and in the ocean, or it washes up on the beach. So that was the one solution problem we wanted to find a solution for. So we have created a solution, which you'll find out in the video. Um, I won't go into too much detail now, but what has come from this solution is further innovation. Uh, it was meeting folks from Bogo Brush and Matrix 4 and looking at alternate ways to deal with that waste once we recover it. Um, recovering it is just one part of the solution. Yeah, we're taking it out of the ocean, we're keeping it from the waste stream, but then what do you do with it? Um, we have piles and piles and piles and piles and piles of plastic that we're covering off the beach. We can do like 500, currently doing around 500 pounds per week. And this is just a small, small area. We need a bigger uh, solution for it and uh, we need an end use for it. Um, what we'll, we're finding is the industry um, doesn't want the plastic that we're covering. Um, and because of a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today. So for us, it's finding, I don't believe that no is an answer. Um, I believe that we can shift the way people look at this product. And it, it has value in my mind because, you know, it can be reused. It's just how do we do that? And what's the solution we find for that? So if you don't mind, I might piggyback off of that real fast, because yeah. I, I do think with new technologies, there is going to be more of a driver for this type of, I mean, you have a, a hierarchy of how clean is the waste. Mm -hmm. if it's really, really, really clean, then you can put it in a lot of applications today. If it's not, then how do you have innovative technologies to transform it to be clean? And I think that's where there's a missing piece, but I'm seeing a lot of development in this space that I think there's an opportunity to take what you're doing and convert that into a, a new a new end market of something that Patricia and Heather can use. Yeah, I agree 100%. And it's funny because when we first had discussions with folks in the Bahamas who are working in the landfill space, they didn't want to talk to us. They said, you're, you know, we don't want it. It's garbage. You know, it's not. And they've been in the recycling industry for years and years and years. Once they saw the product that we were able to pull out, they said, okay, now we want to talk to you. We were wrong. And they to have somebody that's been in the recycling industry for 30 plus years admit that they were wrong is a huge thing. And now they want to work, you know, at looking at what can we do with this waste? They see the benefits now. So sometimes that's what it takes. And I think that's the biz biggest success to date is changing minds, right? Changing opinions and shifting uh, behaviors on dealing with this instead of just chucking it in the landfill and burying it, let's actually do something with it because they see the value in what we're doing. And I think that so far is the biggest win. And I mean, we've only been operational two years. So uh, I will take these wins when we can get them. At the Great Sea Project, we believe that the ocean plastic crisis is a solvable one. By working with communities most impacted in implementing sustainable solutions, we know that we can stem the tide of plastic in the oceans. Of course, this is only a temporary measure if the industry itself doesn't step away from its current trends 
and look at more sustainable practices in terms of plastic production. I'm Ryan Hollenreich. I'm the founder of The Great Sea Project. I've been a leader in the nonprofit sector for more than 15 years, and I founded The Great Sea Project in 2019. We're a social enterprise committed to cleaning plastic from the ocean and the shores. I learned a long time ago the only way to impact change is to involve the communities that we're working in. The Great Sea Project filled the gap in communities without recycling by providing a sustainable solution that's easy to manage, it's off-grid. We build and deliver portable recycling plants that process both ocean plastic and community plastic, feeding the marketplace and keeping the waste from our oceans and shorelines. We also are working to keep that waste out of the landfills. We're taking this and we're making it into this. Our first project went live in South Andros, Bahamas, currently processing over 500 pounds a week with the capability of doing much, much more. And we're creating a revenue stream. We're selling this and it's being turned back into usable products. It's staying out of the waste stream and it's creating a circular economy. The amount of plastic in the ocean is massive, but we know with sustainable solutions like this one, created by us, we're gonna start to make an impact. This is a small but necessary step and we are happy to be leading the charge. By the year 2022, we hope to have eight or more recycling plants delivered to islands all over the Caribbean that'll clean up that waste from the ocean, it'll clean up that waste from the beach, and it'll start to make an impact. We've only got one Earth. Join me. And this is why it's important for you to get involved. This is why it's important for you to support the Great Sea Project, because we really need the help. I mean, this is, you know, think about it, one island in the Caribbean. And how many other islands are there where there's this amount of plastic washing up on the ocean or on the beaches that isn't actually touched? So it's pretty staggering to think about the amount of plastic that's um, pulled out of the ocean. And, you know, this is, again, this is a very small percentage. This is just over, you know, a two month period that's been collected. We're happy to say, though, that the unit in South Andros um, is up and running. And um, we'll give you a test a little later so you can see the, the progress. I'm also happy to say that we have formed some amazing partnerships over the last uh, few months and um, you know it'll go to help further our mission and further uh, the Great Sea Project's uh, impact. Awesome, thank you so much Ryan. It's so fun to see you know really grassroots like on the ground what's what can happen with this waste and to really think about possibilities and hope instead of just feeling kind of lost in the you know images of piles of plastic everywhere. So awesome, thank you for sharing. Um, next, I wanted to step into this question of responsibility. Um, in just the, I don't know, the whole plastics dialogue, I mean, really sustainability dialogue, there's a lot of discussion on like, whose responsibility is it, right? Oh, should consumers change their behavior? Do large corporations need to lead? Um, what about government and policy? Like, who's, whose role is it? There's um, collaboration and there's also finger pointing. So I think let's spend a little bit of time and kind of um, just dive into this topic. And um, Haley, I'm going to start with you and just what is your sense of like whose responsibility is it? What do you want people to know? I think I everybody think says that we can do this alone. <laughs> We're wrong. Um, and we are going to be a lot more effective if we figure out how how does each one of us in the ultimate value chain or, or even as consumers, what role do we play and how can we work on this together? Um, I'm going to, just a few things, consumers can buy recycled content or recyclable products that help further dr drive demand for these types of materials. Companies can invest in designing new products and new recycling technologies and systems at scale. Um, we talked a little bit about this earlier, but on the financial side, um, there's, you know, the new ESG um, uh, systems that are emerging within the fina financial sector and investors, and that's going to be absolutely critical. Um, and then governments, governments um, really can help address a lot of this crisis. Um, just a few data points that I, I found interesting is that um, just in the U.S., there are 10,000 recycling programs according to the EPA. So this super fragmented system increases consumer confusion, it limits scalable solutions, it drives 
valuable materials back into landfills instead of turning them back into uh, packaging, into the packaging space or life cycle. So um, there has been a, a really cool effort by a lot of NGOs, waste management companies, corporations, stakeholders, basically everybody in this uh, recycling ecosystem have put together a blueprint um, for ambitious federal policy to help address this. Um, and that's to have clear reporting requirements, to develop national standards and definitions for recycling systems and clear guidance to the states. And then I think what's really important is also supporting these states with infrastructure investments and tax credits and grants for the recycling initiative. So a lot more to come on this, but I think there's a, you just focused a little bit on government, but I think there's a real role for all of us to play um, in this space to solve it. And, and the, the part that encourages me is that I do believe that this is a solvable problem. Um, so, you know, we just need to, to figure out the role that each uh, party has to play in that. And I do believe that we can solve it. Patricia, what do you, what do you think about this question of responsibility? <laughs> Yeah, I agree with everything you said, Haley. And I think that, you know, for, for me, I look at it um, at both an individual level and as an owner of a manufacturing company that has created plastic, plastic for over four decades. Um, I think overall, it's a collective responsibility. I think it will require all of us um, to be able to push for solution. Um, and I think as at an individual level that, you know, I'm consciously aware of the climate crisis and the impact plastic has on it. Um, and then as an owner of an industrial design company that is designing products that go out into the world and then manufacturing them with its focus in plastic, I'm even more astutely aware. Um, I think at the national, state and local level, policy and reform are critical. Um, I think an acknowledgement to the climate crisis and the science and data is necessary. Um, I think at the industry level, not only as manufacturers, but also the supply chain, um, there's a need to more collaboratively work together to say what is possible, what is maybe possible right now and what's possible in, in the short, mid and long term. Um, and then I think as well at the client level, how do we not only create options and alternatives for clients, but how do we also allow them to create a business model that allows them to pick them up and to run with them? Right now, I hear often if it's going to be more expensive, it's something that they can't choose. Um, and at the client level or the consumer level, how do we get behind some of these alternates that may even look aesthetically different if they have a bio base in them or may not be able to be super clear um, um, from the aesthetic lens. And then I think waste management, you know, becomes the second, the, the last piece of that of, you know, what are we doing at the recycling level? How do we pull back material from waste management processes? How do we create more comprehensive waste management processes? And then how do we also um, support the upcycling of where that goes? Yeah. Um, Ryan, do you have anything to add to any of these? <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, we, we, we have similar opinions and differ in many ways, but um, for me, yeah, the, definitely the government regulation needs to be first and foremost, and it needs to come in there. We need a, a regulated system uh, with mandated, you know, checks and balances. Um, you know, Canada announced the plastics ban um, with very little detail and kudos for the government for doing it, especially during a pandemic, but um, there's no way of actually regulating and making sure that people actually follow this. Um, I think the one of the best ways to regulate an industry is to put harsh fines and or benefits for uh, organizations or companies that aren't following, whether it be on the manufacturing side or whether it be on the recycling side. Um, with, I think it needs to start there and there needs to be accountability. Uh, and I think accountability is the biggest thing. The, I think the biggest problem that we, we come to face and we talk about consumer behavior and, you know, there's companies that talk about, well, I have produced plastic because, because the consumer wants it. Um, you know, if you're not producing plastic or you're producing alternate plastics, the consumer is going to buy it, right? If it's available, they'll buy it. Uh, if they know that it has a benefit to it, they're going to probably lean to it more. 
um, but also we can't we can't make it cost prohibitive um, when we look at these alternatives because of the socioeconomic impact it has. You know, the reason people buy things that are plastic and you know cheap, uh, if you will, is because maybe they can't afford anything else. Um, that's an entire conversation in itself, and I think. But when we look at the ocean plastic problem, which we're addressing, a lot of it is because of poverty and a lot of it is because of lack of regulation uh, and, and lack of oversight in terms of industry. When you look at the garbage patch in the South Pacific and when you look at, you know, the, the growing garbage patch in, in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Belize, these have grown and have been fed by uh, nations, unfortunately, that do not have a, a high GDP or uh, they have a very high level of poverty within their country. So they don't have any of these checks and balances in place like we have in North America, but they're still getting it from the same manufacturers, right? Then Americans are getting it, Canadians are getting it, people in South America are getting it, and they're all coming from the same place. So. Um, I think there needs to be an overarching regulatory body that that monitors plastic production and or the recycling industry. Um, it, and it needs to start from there in terms of, you know, addressing the overarching uh, poverty issue. I mean, that's that's something mountainous that we've been trying to address for, you know, going up 80 to 100 years and, and we're nowhere closer than we were 50 years ago. So I think, you know, there's a mountain there, but I think we can take baby steps to get there but i think we're we're in the last five years i've seen massive inroads uh in terms of looking at uh ways to address this uh if only just talking about the problem that i'm addressing which is ocean plastic um having organizations involved you know you could have a thousand organizations like me out there you know trying to address this problem and there's so much plastic in the ocean right now that we won't even make a dent in it in 50 years. So it really does take a community to be able to, you know, fund organizations like mine that are addressing it, you know, uh, look at regulatory issues and also educate yourself as a consumer because there are alternatives you can buy. Um, um, I, I wanna touch on the, the government uh, regulations and policies and um, a challenge that I see to that, um, is like lobbying. I don't want to leave this panel without addressing, you know, just how do we how do we help the like, policies happen, and how do we help change, adapt, and like what does the role of of lobbying play in slowing down regulations, whether it's in plastic or just across the board? You know, this is a, a topic that especially climate and environmentalists are you know very very passionate about. So. Um, curious, like I will just kind of leave it open. Do any of you like have thoughts on just yeah the role of lobbying and what do you see happening there? I think one, one thing that I I will address is, and, and maybe it's a little um, uh, side ancillary uh, piece is is what is working today in terms of policy or systems and what could be copied or leveraged um, in other geographies. And I point to Europe because through um, the Green Deal, they have made some pretty progressive um, uh, targets out there. They have mandated that all packaging must be recyclable by 2030, that there needs to be a 50% recycling rate in plastic packaging by 2025, talking about uh, recycled content, uh, a, a percentage of recycled content being a mandatory within packaging. And there are EPR fees associated with that, that then, you, if, you, if it's recyclable, you get a reduction on that fee. If it's made with recycled content, you get a reduction. So it's almost incentivizing um, the drive for recyclability and recycled content. And, and that money then goes, it's sometimes managed by PROs, but goes back into fuel and funnel the infrastructure investments. And so I think we have to look at designing policy correctly so that it actually fixes the issue versus sometimes it fills a government budget deficit. Mm -hmm. It's not helping anything. So, you know, how do you design the policy in the way that it is targeted and it fix, fixes a lot of these issues so that we can make impact on um, the issues that, that we're seeing today. So that's my, my point is just making it um, effective. 
I, I, and I think you're right. I mean, Europe is, is miles ahead of North America in terms of this. I mean, they incentivize even down to the consumer level um, where giving money back for recyclables. Um, it's done on a small scale now, but they're, they're on the right path. Um, to flip it back though, to the lobbying question, and I think that is one of, it's one of capitalism's biggest fault is letting industry determine regulation through lobbying and through uh, procedures like that. And I think, you know, are we ever going to get away from it? Absolutely not. Should we put the, you know, the design of uh, incentivized regulatory system in the hands of industry? I think they should have a say. I don't think they should design it. Um, I think you need to involve, involve more of the, um, you know, consumers uh, and or environmentalists, the experts that know, the people that don't deny cli climate change, right? People that are looking at the, the world as a whole, uh, be more of the drivers for that. Um, but I think that there is a happy medium in getting involved. I think it's very important to have industry involved and, and taking part in it. I think though, so, the lobbying sector unfortunately has done a lot of damage to a lot of environmental policies because it's driven by profit. And I think, you know, which is why I would say in terms of regulation, you don't only incentivize companies to participate, you also make it harder when they don't participate. So you tax them more, they have to pay a fee for cleanup or disposal fee or recycling fee or something on top of if they're going to participate and be a part of the solution, yeah, they can be incentivized. They can get tax credits. They can pay, you know, get something paid back into their bottom line. But if they're not going to participate, if they're going to continue to be a problem, then yeah, they're going to pay for the cleanup. They're going to pay for the recycling industry. They're going to pay for the the uh, the damage that's done to the earth. And I think that's the only really way to, you know, uh, regulate somebody who's not going to do it. I would love to like let's uh, introduce Haley a little bit more. Um, and take a look at her, her two minute intro. Hi, I'm Haley, and this is Brody. He's my rescue dog. We're coming to you live today from Austin. And while we're super bummed we can't be here at South by Southwest in person, let's make this fun virtually. So come on, I wanna show you a few things around the city. First, let's talk plastic waste. We all know that people on this planet are increasing and we're gonna need more food, more energy, and we will generate more waste. Anytime I go on a walk and I see this gold lying on the ground, it spurs me to action. A friend of mine, Jeff, created a startup called Literati. It's a crowdsourcing waste cleanup model. He says, individually, you can make a difference, but collectively, we can make true impact. You know, today, it's become so popular to be anti-plastic. People love to hate plastic. Why is this? You know, I think it's that plastic is becoming an image of what's wrong today. In our mind, plastic now means overconsumption, complicated systems that we don't control anymore. And we hate to be so addicted to convenience. On one side, there's the problem of a material that's only recycled at 9% globally, and it's ending up in the environment. But on the other side, it's important to remember that plastics are still incredibly important to society to keep food fresh and hospitals safe. And they play a pivotal role in a low carbon world. Plastics have the lowest carbon footprint of most products. So how do we solve these solvable issues and not just burden shift? I have spent the last 15 years working all over the world for a leading material science company, Dow, I'm super passionate about business being an incredible vehicle to solve social and environmental challenges. Working on designing packaging to be more recyclable and reusable to creating recycled products and ultimately new advanced recycling technologies that can help transform the way that we recycle today. Think back to the future's flux capacitor. My goal is to ensure that all materials can be part of the circular economy. I look forward to the discussion today. And, you know, I think there's a piece as a manufacturer that you spend so much capital intensity on building out your infrastructure and your organization and your system. And then these changes would, you know, I think there's a fear that these changes would 
remove all of that progress or that system. And, and instead, I think if we, if we moved it out of the fear-based approach, which is we need to keep it exactly as it is, and we've built this system and it's working and we're making money and we figured it out and moved it into, you know, how do we take that system and expand upon it or and build out something of benefit? But I think often at the capitalistic side, we don't see the and and we move into the fear pattern of whatever policy is going to change is going to negatively impact my business and cost me more money. And I think I, that's spot on, Patricia. And from, from my view, the more that you can communi communicate things in terms of this represents a business opportunity for us, right? And, and this is a new market segment that you, you can grow and you can play and you can make you know, big strides to helping on the environmental footprint, as well as driving some impact to your bottom line. The both and uh, piece uh, really will drive this forward. I think that's what's going to change is when, when, when the industry and when, when many people look at this as an opportunity, which, which we do. Yeah. Innovation drives the sector, or innovation can drive the sector. It can also drive the the solution and. You know, so many in so many different sectors, we've been so amiss to to try something different because you know we're worried about the bottom line, or we're worried about it not working, or we're worried about you know having to change and invest. But I mean, we wouldn't be where we are today being able to talk via video and record this if they're without innovation and without somebody saying, "Hey, you know what? I'm going to try something different because I know we can do it differently." So. Uh, you know, I think that that has a big part and incentivizing innovation, you know, is one of the, the most capitalistic things we could do in order to drive change. And I think it's about taking that approach that's very important. So, you know, and like on the innovation side, you know, as like the, <laughs> the startup product to brands of, of the group, like totally. And I mean, I can even see in the market in the, I mean, we started product development over eight years ago which but we like launched maybe five years ago. It's like the market has even adapted so much um, since when we very first started trying to sell to places like CVS or you know wherever. And so innovation absolutely works. I think one of the things that we see is like the, one of the main things holding back um, the success of you know, innovation that companies like Bogo Brush are driving is scale. And so it's like, how do we help achieve Scale. And I think that's also a space for collaboration with um, large companies, um, large buyers, with manufacturers all around. It's like as you scale, then those costs do shift. The last, the last little intro is from me. You can watch a couple minutes on like more of my philosophy and what's going on um, at Bogo Brush. Hi, I'm Heather, you know, co-founder and CEO of Bogo Brush. To me, sustainability is the balance of all things. It's the cycles of efficiency that we're all a part of. I see that the problem with sustainability today is that we are losing connection as a humanity, losing connection to our inherent wiring for being sustainable. And therefore the results that we're creating are less efficient. Reconnecting with the planet and these inherent wirings is part of why John, my brother and I created Bogo Brush, an eco-friendly toothbrush that gives back to communities. See, we wanted to do something that would help you, right? Think about the planet and think about your neighbors every morning and every night. And how does our toothbrush right, connect to plastic? Well, really by chance. We initially thought, like a lot of people, oh, let's make it out of bamboo or wood. But what we realized is that we were losing over 50% of material just due to the natural characteristics of trying to produce in wood. And wood, when it gets wet, what happens? It grows bacteria, mold. None of this is what we wanted for our sustainability brand. So we connected with partners and innovators who could help us look at what worked about plastic, but what doesn't work. How can we use plants and other alternatives to create a, pro a product that's beautiful and functional, but also is driving forward for the future of the world? And overall, 
if we can do anything right, to help empower you to find your connection to the planet, then the better off we all are. Okay, so you've met us all and we've had a lot of really exciting conversation. Uh, the last thing here is we'll just go around and say um, the future. You know, what is it? What's something, like, what's a takeaway that you hope people watching um, will, will remember? Uh, Patricia, let's start with you. You know, I think it's, it's along the lines of what you were just sharing, Heather, which is, is an opportunity to be better, but not perfect. And it's something that I, even as I bought this factory, was like, how can I consciously and aligned to spirit work in plastic? Right. When I lived on the coast for most of my adult life and seeing microplastic come up um, and, and obviously see the big the big challenges there. But I wanted to be part of the solution. And I think each of us at an individual level or at a business level can become part of that. And so, you know, in my small lens, what I often see is the polar extremes, either that, you know, you're, you're completely against the climate crisis or science and the data or your, you know, for, for lack of better description, like a granola hugging, you know, hip um, that is really um, driven by the environment. And what I hope to do is create the middle ground where more opportunities can exist for larger groups of people to buy into it. And so whether or not that's a small change of going to a refillable deodorant or utilizing a refillable plastic bottle or being able to partner with Ryan and Logo Brush on getting an ocean waste plastic into a product. Um, those are all the things that I'm really excited about. Awesome. Ryan. Everybody just take away one thing is just to educate yourself a little bit more on the industry and plastic itself. There are good uses, there are necessary uses, um, and you know, but there are better ways of doing it. In terms of addressing the ocean plastic problem, you know, it's a massive problem and we need everybody's help to do it. Um, it's not a standalone. I don't have all the answers, nor do the, you know, 10 other organizations doing the same thing or similar things as me. Um, it's such a huge problem that we need to find solutions. So, you know, from, if there's manufacturers out there, look at using ocean plastics and how you're going to do that better. Don't just say no to it, you know, have an open mind and let's find that happy medium so that we can actually find these solutions together. All right, Haley, what do you think? Take away, what do you want folks to know? Yeah, so um, I think when we talked about this a little bit, Heather, it was about um, these polarizing views always always exist and I actually think um, polarizing views can inspire or force change but it's in this middle ground where action happens and you're not being paralyzed by anger or disbelief um, and you really make can make a lot of progress so um, I would just encourage people to harness energy into like Ryan said Digging and digging in and grounding yourself on scientific facts, understanding, you know, LCA benefits or decisions of your of your purchasing impacts, your recycling choices that you make, um, your wallet or your purse they they speak. So buy recyclable products. Um, join um, in my intro. You saw uh, Literati uh, is a really cool new startup who is actually working on crowdsourcing waste apps. So. Figure out how you can get involved in, in activities like that and see the impact that collectively we can make. And then finally, I would say for those who are starting a business or part of one, um, partner with some unconventional or uncomfortable, uncomfortable partners. And remember that business can be a powerful force for change through the scale and the impact that business brings, but also for society and for the environment. Um, because I, I firmly believe that growing your business and protecting the environment should never be at odds. Um, so I'll leave it with that. <laughs> these, all these takeaways, it reminds me of back to a soap opera, you know, and like we want things to be like heroes and villains, you know, we like categorize them like that. But really the most interesting characters in any story are the complex ones. Right, the ones that have friction and tension, because that's where the growth happens. And that's really what we're all saying here is, you know, go into that space of a little bit of discomfort and ask yourself, what can you do in that space? You know, what, what is that for you? And uh, 
be, be part of the change, be part of the innovation. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, reach out to us with any questions at all. Um, thank you, Haley, Ryan, Patricia, for all of your time, for all of your knowledge. I wish we could talk for like 20 hundred hours. <laughs> we'll do it again sometime, but thank you. Everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.